fun tonight. Um, thanks everybody out there in webinar land. Um, hopefully this webinar will prove to be helpful and insightful for you. You know, I'm looking forward to spending the next, what is it, three hours with you? No, I'm kidding, of course, the next hour with you. Um, like Nate said, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. You know, normally if there's some sort of a discussion question during uh, the conversation, somebody will raise their hand. Unfortunately, I can't see those, those chat questions come through, so Nathan or Kim are gonna go ahead and uh, alert me to those questions, but I'm happy to answer and field any questions. I think you'll probably find that during the, the conversation, most of, well, a lot of your questions may be answered. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about me. Um, this is me, you know, I grew up in uh, Utah, Idaho, Montana, spent most of my life in Missouri. Uh, originally I started by studying music at Central Missouri State in Warrensburg, Missouri, go mules. Um, took a couple year break, went to Taiwan as a missionary. Um, then I came back and married the daughter of an orthodontist and began my dental journey. So I spent some time at UMKC doing pre-dent um, and finished my dental training at UMKC Dental School in Kansas City, graduating there in 2006, like Nate said. Um, after that, I had kind of an interesting pathway um, getting through uh, several practice opportunities. I started my own practice. I bought another one a year later. I merged that a few years later. Um, and eventually transitioned out of that group for a variety of reasons and, and partnered with a, a Pacific Dental Service, Services supported practice. And looking back, that was one of the best decisions personally that I made. Um, and having, if I would have had a chance to do it all over again, I would have started in a supported practice from day one. So all that aside, um, this is me on the, on the right here. Hopefully you can all see my mouse moving. Um, this is the practice I started there. Here's some team members here. This is my family. Um, if any of you have ever read, you know, Simon Sinek, I'm sure that name is familiar. You know, start with why. What is your why? Well, this is my why. My why is my family. Um, so that's why I do what I do to provide them a means um, of living a comfortable life and to serve patients. So currently I'm uh, working in O'Fallon and I also am a partner in an office in St. Peter's about 15 miles down the road. So uh, objectives for today. We want to talk about mainly three things as it relates to dental implants. Number one, we want to provide methods and processes to diagnose and educate patients on single tooth dental implant therapy. Number two, assist in understanding the options available when restoring single tooth imp uh, dental implants. And number three, articulate workflows for successful single tooth dental implant restorations. So hopefully as we go through the discussion tonight, you will get a good feel for these objectives. Um, and like I said, feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll do our very best to get them answered. We do have a limited amount of time, um, but we'll do our best to get them answered. So this behind me is a nice concrete wall, just in case you're wondering. Um, we moved about six months ago into a new home and I haven't had a chance to set my office anywhere. So I'm directly below the Wi-Fi router. That's why I'm here. So we have a nice solid connection, at least for my end. Um, so that's why the concrete wall. Anyway, so why is the information that we're gonna discuss important? Um, you know, several items, these are a few that kind of float to the top. Most dental students have, have a limited uh, to no practical implant restorative experience during dental school. Uh, dental implants are the standard of care when we're talking about replacing multiple or single missing teeth in most cases. Most GPs don't begin placing dental implants at all or until years after graduation. And many implant placing specialists are not as focused on the restorative aspect of dental implant placement as the GPs that have to put the crowns on them are. So as we're going through the lecture as well, you'll see lots of images and pictures here on the right side or the left side or wherever they are. Um, these are all cases that I've had a hand in. Um, this case that you see here is one that we'll dig into a little bit more. Um, this is an immediate guided uh, dental implant surgery. Um, I was able to place that Nobel, Nobel active uh, implant myself. All right, so let's talk about one of the cases. So I just mentioned that oftentimes the, the surgeons are not as focused on the restoration as the general dentists are. Well, here's a case in point. So you can see the angulation of these implants isn't ideal, obviously. They're not perfectly parallel with each other and they're kind of going off in different planes, buccolingual. Um, so having some information from the standpoint of where the surgeon wants or where the GP that's restoring the implant wants the implant is always helpful to these surgeons. But this information that we're going to discuss today um, is helpful in, in that regard that it'll give you a feel for some ways you can communicate with your surgeon when you get to that point. So this case was rescued 
fortunately, by an amazing lab technician uh, who made this five unit bridge there. This is a cantilever bridge, obviously. The, these two teeth are cantilevered off the music portion of that bridge. This, this lady's name is Roxanne. Um, fun lady, this is from, I don't know, 12 years ago or 10 years ago or something. Really fun lady. This was an adventure. One of these implants, just as an aside, um, was so buried. Um, it was so far under the bone that it took me a couple of hours to find the implant in her jawbone. But in the end, she ended up with a great, uh, great outcome, great smile. Okay, let's talk a little bit about having the right tool. So as we go through the discussion, we'll talk about some ways to educate our patients and some options that we have for replacing missing teeth. Not every patient is going to be the best implant candidate. So make sure you choose the right tool for the job. In this case, um, this uh, is a kind of a fun case. These are my two of my daughters. This is several years ago. Uh, the one on the right, her name is Campbell. Right now she's 15. The one in the, sitting down in the chair, her name is Ruth Ann. She's 17. You can see they've got a chopstick right here and they're obviously watching some video about how to put that in their hair. This is my mother-in-law's gift to them was the chopstick set of chopsticks for their hair. And they're fairly expensive, I guess. Um, so my daughters, of course, watched a bunch of videos and here is Campbell, beautiful outcome, right? This is exactly the right tool for her hair. And the same thing for Ruth Ann, very nice hair. But not every patient um, is a good candidate for, you know, for this time, sorry. That's obviously my head. And I haven't lost much more hair than that. But make sure you have the right tool for the right job. Not every patient's gonna be a good dental implant candidate. Okay, let's talk about diagnosing. So we're, we're gonna talk about our first objective, providing methods and processes to diagnose and educate patients on single implant dental implant therapy. So we're gonna dig into a little bit about indications for single tooth dental implant placement restoration, the options for replacing a single tooth edentulous space, um, good, better, best, which is a great conversation to have with your patients, and then we need to keep it simple, okay? I find a lot of us get, get into discussions with patients that are way too complicated. Um, and so we wanna talk about keeping it simple. So patient comes in, they've got a uh, missing tooth or several missing teeth. How are we gonna approach that with them? What are some ways that we can have a conversation with them um, to educate them as to what's going on uh, and give them some options? So generally speaking, we have three options, right? There's the removable option, the part that comes in and out, snaps in, snaps out. Uh, it's a good option for you um, if you're looking for the most cost effective and least comfortable. Um, I have a lot of patients that we do a lot of partials. I'm not opposed to partial dentures, but in most cases, this is not the best option. So the second option is the dental bridge. Now these are both Ceric bridges. Sorry, they're a little bit grainy. Um, these are same day bridges made in a lithium disilicate off of a machine in my office. So bridges are a great option. We do lots of bridges as well. But of course, the gold standard, as we've talked about, is the dental implant restoration. Um, and why are these so much better? Well, success rates and you know, aesthetics in general, and there are a lot of benefits. Um, not only that, but long-term longevity and outcome are uh, some of the best things uh, that we can offer our patients with dental implants. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those patients for whom dental implants are not a good option. So this is a young lady um, in her 50s or so um, who came into the office um, with a broken bicuspid and obviously she wanted this tooth fixed. She was in some pain. Um, unfortunately, based on her medical history, she was not a dental implant candidate. And the reason for that was she was currently undergoing chemo and radiation therapy to her jaw. Um, her jaw was in the field of view. So we could not go through any surgery unless we wanted to take 16 weeks and do hyperbaric oxygen therapy and a huge you know, risk of radio osteonecrosis of the jaw. And so we took a step back after consulting with her physician and running her through a course of antibiotics to buy some time. We decided the best thing we could do is try to keep that, what's left of that tooth healthy. So here are the radiographs there. Abscess, obviously. Um, there is some tooth left, definitely not a lot of the tooth left, um, but that for her was a very visible tooth. Um, she wanted to keep it, she wanted to save it. So we did our best to try to fix it. So I don't have any problems with herodontics, you know, trying to save a tooth from time to time. And so we did the endo and I put in six titanium pins. Um, my personal preference uh, is to avoid posts where possible. 
um, primarily because of the increased risk of root fracture. Uh, and I don't feel oftentimes that a post can be the best outcome. So I've gravitated toward titanium pins. So this is six titanium pins. There's a little bit of sealer from the uh, root canal treatment that we, we placed the pins and did the root canal. So there's some sealer there that you're seeing around the pins. Uh, and then we put a crown on that tooth. And I think we're at the two years follow up now and this tooth is still in service. Um, so she was not a dental implant candidate, but we were still able to offer her a good long-term outcome because we thought outside the box a little bit. Now we don't wanna make thinking outside the box our go-to from the standpoint of uh, choices and options. We wanna make sure we're doing our best to stay well within the confines of you know, high success rate, good long-term standards of practice. Um, but sometimes we have to take a step outside the box. And this is one of those. Um, I've done this from time to time, saving a tooth that was kind of borderline or even past borderline. Um, and fortunately this one turned out really, really well. Okay, so let's talk about a specific 3D planning case that I alluded to before. Um, with regard to dental implants, we have a lot of power now with 3D implant or 3D uh, uh, x-rays. So this one was a case that I did when I was back in Albuquerque. Um, I want to say this was about six years ago. Um, it, was a, it was a great case, Aaron Hernandez. Uh, his wife uh, was actually an assistant or a uh, benefits coordinator of mine. And so we uh, went through this uh, planning case. And you can see here, this is a Simplant software, um, which I worked with the dental lab. I think it was Glidewell Dental Lab. Um, it may have been a different lab. I don't remember, to be honest. Hmm. I had to look that up. Um, but what we did is I, I scanned 3D scan with, um, with CEREC. I also sent some models and then we sent over the, uh, the cone beam. And then the lab technician got me on the phone. Um, I did a webinar kind of like we're doing now and we walked through placement, location and positioning. Now what we can do with some of the software that's out there is we can actually as the GP in, in our office, assuming you have a cone beam and you have the software, you can do all this yourself. And if you have the machinery, you can either print or mill your own, your own guide. So, Let's go forward just a little bit and talk about some specifics, um, more specifics of this case. Um, there's that image on the right side that you saw before. You can see the pre-op clinical condition. You know, in retrospect, could we have tried to save this tooth? We, we probably could have tried uh, long-term after, uh, you know, taking the tooth out and realizing how much decay was down there subgingively. I think it was a good choice that we took that tooth out. Um, but you can see here, you know, before and then the implant afterwards. Uh, we had measured uh, with the cone beam x-ray, there was plenty of space between the sinus and where that implant was. There was no sinus perforation despite, you know, you can see the floor of the sinus here. Um, I think we were up to the side of the sinus slightly, um, but there wasn't any perforation there, unfortunately. We got a really good initial stability um, in excess of 35 or 50 newton centimeters of torque there. And then what I did, as you can see on the left side, I'll kind of walk you through that process and then we'll jump back into the, into the discussion topic. Here's the pre-op picture. Here is the guide in place with the final drill through that guide. Now there's a little key that we use um, that, that uh, helps to center that drill in the guide. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, so let me take a step back even further. I decoronated the tooth. I cut the top of the tooth off, left the roots. Um, then we went ahead and used the, the sequence of drills through the tooth roots. My worry was, you know, you've got these tooth roots going off in different directions. If we were to take the whole tooth out, it'd be difficult to get a purchase point down in the interfercal bone space. So we went ahead and, and used the guide. These are tooth roots you can still see in place. Here is the drill. Um, after I finished this osteotomy, took the drill out, then I removed the roots. Um, you can see the root crypts here, and this is actually the implant in place. This is the Nobel Active. Um, I want to say it's a 5.0 by 11. I'm, I'm not remembering exactly though, um, but it's an internal conical connection. Um, and then you can see after we put the implant in, then I put on a tie base and a scan body, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's a 3D scanning uh, process. Uh, and I scanned and actually had this crown manufactured uh, before the patient even came back. Uh, for his second stage surgery. Um, but after we scanned, then we went ahead and put a cover screw on there, put a little bone graft uh, and some collagen over it and uh, left him or let him, let him leave the office. So that was a fun case, just to illustrate how much control we have over the process 
with regard to uh, digital dentistry and uh, surgical placement of dental implants. So let's talk about appropriate sites for dental implants. Um, I want to dig into just a little bit um, what I would suggest and what I've used as a rule of thumb for spacing between adjacent tooth structures. So, you know, if we take a step back and look at the very big picture, you know, we're talking now about how we appropriately diagnose and recommend dental implants. Um, what is the spacing requirement? Now you can dig into the literature and there are some different numbers. Generally speaking, I have the numbers that I'm going to show you um, are based on my personal preference uh, and they're an overestimate. Now, can we go a little bit less than these numbers? Sure. Um, I think you can go to one and a half. Uh, between an implant and adjacent tooth, two millimeters in between two implants, but I like to keep it safe. Um, so these are the numbers, kind of the rule of thumb that I use. So adjacent, you know, teeth to implants, two millimeters in between two implants, three millimeters, that's for papilla space. Um, you know, papillas like teeth, they don't like implants so much, so we need to maintain as much blood flow to that papilla in between two implants as we can. Uh, so save as much bone. Of course, you have this thing called an incisive canal and a bunch of nerves. So you want to watch out. Um, mesial and distal, again, same thing applies. Generally, you want one and a half or two millimeters and then buckle the lingual. You can go to as little as one millimeter of cortical plate, but why risk it? You know, if we're in a situation where we need to uh, place an implant, why would you compromise the long-term outcome uh, by placing it too close to the buckle plate and possibly create a dehiscence? So these are kind of some rules of thumb that I've used in the past. Hey, Dr. King? Yeah. Hey, we have a few questions that came across Great. here. So uh, the first one is from Dylan. He asks, okay. what is the age minimum for an implant patient? I've heard conflicting things, but the consensus seems to be 20 years old. So I was wondering your thoughts on it. Personally, I'd suggest you, you and this is kind of a roundabout question or not a dodge, but I would suggest we need to, we need to confirm that the, the patient's bone has stopped growing. Um, and I think I've used 18 as kind of a rule of thumb. And let me give you a, a, an example. I don't remember exactly the patient's name, but I had a patient when I was back in Independence, Missouri, outside of Kansas City, who had had a dental implant placed, an anterior implant placed when he was in his middle teens. And he came to me when he was in his, I want to say late 20s. And, you know, we know how, how bone grows. The bone itself doesn't move. It's apposition on the facial side of the maxillary bone. So that implant stayed there and the bone grew anterior to it. So when he came to me, he had an implant crown, which was beautiful, but it was set way back to the lingual. So we had to replace that crown. We had to do a really interesting angled abutment um, to make it, you know, to make it work. But in, in the end, you know, to answer your question a little simpler, I would suggest that the most valuable thing we need to look for is, is the, this sensation of bone growth in whatever bone you're placing it in. So I've used 18 as a rule of thumb. Great. Now the second question is from Lewis. He asks, uh, the implant here seems a bit close to the maxillary sinus. Wouldn't a sinus lift be indicated? Uh, absolutely when it's indicated, you bet. Now this case here that you're looking at on the screen, um, this was not, not a perforation. It was very close, um, but because the, you know, we're looking at a flattened, uh, a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, um, it wasn't in the sinus, but it was very close. So yes, oftentimes a, a maxillary sinus lift or a sinus bump is warranted when we get an implant apex that's close or you know encroaching on the sinus. Um, routinely in this situation now, now this like I said was a few years ago, um, I would automatically include the sinus graft uh, proposal cost-wise and the discussion with the with the patient at the outset. So I'd prepare them for needing a sinus lift. But then when the surgeon goes in and places the, you know, opens the osteotomy, if they're free and clear away from the sinus, when they take that final pre-positioning x-ray, um, then they just won't do it. And the patient feels like you're a hero because you just saved them 2,500 bucks. But yes, to answer your question, it does look very close. Um, in retrospect, potentially we could have placed a, a sinus graft, um, but he, he ultimately, the, the implant, implant turned out just fine uh, because we didn't. Great. Thanks, Dr. King. Yeah. Okay, all right, so let's move on. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about education for our patients. Um, so a couple of things to consider, you know, like I mentioned, we wanna keep it really simple. Too much information can oftentimes be a really big turnoff for our patients. Um, and this, there's a delicate balance we have to strike with regard to how much information we share um, and how, how simple we're keeping it 
uh, my practice in O'Fallon right now is uh, a lot of patients there work at Boeing uh, here in St. Louis, um, which they're all engineers. They're very intelligent. These are very intelligent people. They want to ask a lot of questions. So I don't have any problems giving them as much detail as they ask for. But I found that the more specific details we, and we give them, volunteer them outside of the regular discussion, um, sometimes it can confuse them. And then they have too much to think about. And then they're on Google all night long. And then they never schedule. For so we want to avoid information overload as we're discussing with our patients. You know, keep it very simple. And this little uh, diagram that I have on the right side is kind of how I explain things to patient, patients. You know, you have a missing tooth. There are really three parts to that. Dental implant replacement, there's the artificial tooth root, which mirrors the natural tooth. There's a crown, which looks like your natural tooth above the gums. And then there's a piece that connects them called the dental abutment or the implant abutment. Um, something like that, you know, with an illustration like you see here and a little handout um, is very helpful to give to patients. Um, gory details, you know, a lot, of, a lot of patients just don't want it. Um, again, it can be kind of uh, leave a bad taste in their mouth if you give them too much information. But we do want to help our patients understand consequences and urgency. One of the things that I've found uh, as I have coached um, and mentored uh, younger doctors, uh, like I was mentored uh, when I came out of dental school, is oftentimes we skip over the consequence and leave out the urgency of the problem. You know, we go straight to the you need. You have a cavity or you have a, you know, abscess, therefore you need. We miss that whole middle section, the whole discussion of, well, what's going to happen if I leave it untreated and what's, what's the time frame of needing to get this done? So make sure you include these things in your discussion with the patient in a way that's not demeaning. We don't want to be demeaning, you know, we don't want to be, a, well, do you want to let this infection get out of control and kill you? We don't want to be, you know, manipulative, uh, but we want to make sure our patients have an opportunity to understand what the problem is, what's going on with this situation, uh, and then uh, give them some options to move forward with treatment. So avoid that you need, the I know better than you approach. Uh, it's helpful to sit down, and when you're having these discussions with them, I would encourage you to take off all your PPE as much as you can, especially in COVID-19 right now, we're supposed to leave on. But take off as much as you can and move around to the front of the patient so you can look right in their eyes. Uh, it's helpful to be able to see them face to face as much as possible rather than talking while they're laying back or to the side of them. See if you can get around to the front of them so you can have more, a more meaningful conversation. Okay. So what are we gonna do after implant placement? So let's just say we've had the discussion with our patient, they've gone ahead and they've opted to go ahead with the dental implant. Um, what happens after the dental implant placement? Well, we've got to make sure we get the clearance from the surgeon. Now, if that's us as a surgeon um, that placed the implant, make sure you make some specific chart note that you torque tested the implant um, or, and that you feel that it's appropriate to, um, to restore. Now, a note about torque testing. I was asked, asked this question the last time um, I gave this uh, lecture. Uh, torque testing, you know, there are differences of, of opinion there. Uh, generally speaking, the rule of thumb that I use is I, I use the same torque wrench that I use for restorative procedures, engage it in the implant, the implant itself, and then reverse it to 35 newton centimeters. So if I can get the torque to 35 newton centimeters and the implant doesn't reverse out, I'm happy to restore it, assuming it's get, been given an appropriate healing time frame, which for me, if you've got a virgin bone site and you had good initial stability, that's two to four months. Now, if you've got a bone graft that went in, an immediate extraction with an implant placement, we're looking at six months. Um, but virgin, perfectly healthy bone site, like I said, two to four months, if you can get a torque test of 35 newton centimeters. That varies depending on the manufacturer. It also varies depending on your individual um, comfort level and uh, what you were trained. Okay, parts and pieces, what to order and when. We're gonna talk a little bit about patient education and financial puzzle pieces. But first, oh, this is a case we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, first, this is a, an implant placement itself. This is, there's two teeth there, 28, 29. Um, this particular implant, you can see there on the lower left, that's called a TI-101. This is a Taiwanese implant that uh, I was asked to, to try when I was in Albuquerque. It's a very interesting implant. It's got a, a really cool um, surface coating. It makes it almost like a bioactive glass surface coating. So I think, uh, I think it's Zimmer that has the SLA active um, coating, although I don't remember exactly. Um, this one has a very high uh, affinity for blood. So if you, you know, put a drop of blood at the tip, then the blood immediately wicks all the way up through the, 
through the threads. So um, we're talking about what to do after the dental implant placement. Well, a lot of it depends on how well the implant placement went, like I said. But I'll, I'll give you a minute just to watch this. There's another implant that goes in here in just a second. You can see that the torque wrench breaks at 35. So you know we're getting past 35 newton centimeters of torque. We don't want to go too far past that because the moment you go too far past 35 newton centimeters of torque, you start to damage the bone. Um, so it takes, it takes some caution and uh, being real careful as you're placing the implant. Um, a note about that, I uh, started placing dental implants uh, in 2007, a year after I got out of dental school, I went through a course with Dr. Uh, John Julian with the Dick Barnes Group, um, and it was Ankylos. It's a dense supply product. So here comes the second implant there. Uh, after that, I began with some appropriate supervision for my first handful of dental implants, placing my own implants. And I placed uh, probably an average of 20 a month or so, um, I don't know, for a few years. And then I started handing that off to my oral surgeon and periodontist. But honestly, if you can place a post in the tooth, if you can do a root canal, if you're, not, if you're comfortable placing pins into a tooth, a dental implant is not that big of a stretch. You just have a few things you have to be cautious of. Make sure that you're not John Waning it, as my mentor would say. Hey, Dr. Just, King, we had yeah. another question come across. Yeah. Uh, so Dylan asks, do you usually do immediate implant placement or do you prefer two-step implant placement? And then in which situations do you do which? Good question. So immediate implant placements, um, I personally have no problem placing a, a dental implant into a non-infected bone site immediately after a tooth comes out, assuming, number one, there's no infection, like I said, and number two, I can get good primary stability and complete coverage of that implant uh, below the crest of the, the bone. And, you know, and then a lot of that requires bone grafting. But then it has to be buried for six months, completely covered for six months. Now, that has to happen in the right situation and in the right patient, um, six months. Uh, although I, I have no problem with doing a two-step approach um, where we take the tooth out. And if there's any infection present, um, I'm going to do a two-step approach. If there's an abscess, um, then we don't want to, we just don't want to risk any of that tissue, even though I'm going to debride and I'm going to scrape the inside and curette it out. Um, we just don't want to risk getting an infection in there. I guess that's looping around. Um, so generally, personally, I'm, I'm comfortable doing an immediate implant placement with an extraction. Um, I've actually also done some immediate implant placements, not after an extraction with an immediate load with a permanent crown. I played with that a little bit and that was fun. But now since I'm handing off most of my dental implants to the specialists, they prefer to do it in a two-step approach. So, all right, does that answer the question? Hopefully so. Yes, great, thank you. You are welcome. Okay, so little implant surgery. Um, I am gonna have to start flying through slides here, everybody. So let's talk about the right part for the right job. Make sure you have the right part for the right job. Although this crown looks like it was you know, done right, obviously there's something wrong with the occlusal plane. And this is because I had the wrong part for the, for the job. I did not order the right part. And there are a lot of parts we have to order when we're talking about dental implants. You know, whether it's healing abutments, making sure you have the right restorative kits, if you're gonna be scanning, um, impression copings, what size, you know, this is Nobel Active, the regular, the narrow, the wide, and the 3.0. So you gotta make sure you have the right size of everything, which is, you know, horrendous. Um, I know we have one oral surgeon that, uh, is at an outside practice, and if he places an implant, he'll automatically send you, the same day, he'll send you the impression coping for that implant. So you get it in the mail two months before you need it or three months before you need it. So there are some surgeons and you know, specialists that do that, um, but it, it takes, it takes a, a village, it takes an army to make sure you have the right parts and pieces. So make sure you have the right partners with the right vendors. All right, so we've talked about the surgery, and we've talked about having parts and pieces. Let's talk a little bit about the second stage surgery. Now this, this is what happens after you've allowed that implant to heal and integrate for the appropriate amount of time. 
um, which for me in most cases, like I said, a virgin extraction site or a virgin site where the bone is completely healed um, is two to four months, depending on the situation with a, with a torque test um, at that time to make sure that it's stable. Uh, but what do we do with the second stage surgery? Well, basically we're uncovering, and this is that case before, I couldn't find a good picture to illustrate this. Basically we're uncovering the implant if it needs to be. Now, if we've gone in and we placed our little healing cap, as you can see here, and it ends up right at the height of the tissue, then there is no second stage surgery aside from the need to do a torque check um, on the implant to make sure it's integrated well. Um, but yeah, if you need to, you may actually have to remove bone, like I said with that case with Roxy earlier on. Um, we may have to remove some bone to get to the implant. So you have to be very cautious. Titanium is very durable, but it's very soft. And if you hit it with a high speed handpiece or a low speed, you can deform it and it, it's not hard to destroy the threading that's inside there. So be very cautious. If you're not comfortable uncovering something, then let the surgeon do it. Let them, let them take the risk. Okay, um, along the lines of making sure things fit, um, let's talk a little bit about impression options. There's digital and there's analog, but again, it all requires some specific right size fit. So this is the Amazon truck. Thank goodness McDonald's had anticipated that happening. Um, that Amazon Prime truck slid right under there. He, he should have measured, right? He should have gone out with a tape measure and measured to make sure he was the right size. Anyway, make sure you have the right size as you're going through. Um, we talked a little bit about these guys already. Um, the impression copings that you're seeing on the right. When we're talking about analog, I'm referring to impression materials. You know, the goopy impression materials, polyvinyl siloxane or polysiloxane vinyl, whatever vinyl polysiloxane, depending on which school you went to. Um, we, we're gonna talk about closed versus open tray. And these ones on the right side are for closed tray impressions. So you got a little bit of lingo to learn. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the basics. Here are the specifics. Closed tray on the left, where you have an impression coping that is completely enveloped in the impression. Um, and when you pull the impression, the impression coping stays. Um, the open tray impression you have these big tall screws and you actually drill holes through the impression. The impression tray goes down um, and then you unscrew these. And then as you pull the impression out, then the impression copings come out in the impression. So there are benefits of both ways. Generally, the open tray impression is a little more accurate because it doesn't require us to pop that impression coping back in. It stays, it blocks in, so there's potentially less distortion. All right, so what do we have here? What are these pieces here? Well, this is a, an open, op, uh, closed tray, I'm sorry, impression coping screwed into an implant analog. And this is the analog there. And this is what the lab will use um, when we uh, send them the case, the impression, which we will send to them, they'll use this to duplicate the position of the implant. So it would be worthwhile if and when you start doing this, um, to have your own implant analogs. Uh, because the lab will charge you an arm and a leg and these are not that expensive. You can send them to the lab and have them send them back. Um, but again, you got to know what size that you have. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the open impression process. Um, it's helpful once you get those impression coping seated, which again must be the right size, to verify they're seated with an x-ray, which means you have to know what you're looking for. Usually a bite wing where you can see the interface of the implant with the impression coping to make sure there's no gap uh, is all you'll need. Um, but before you take the impression, we've got to make sure we do it right. Um, you certainly can send for a custom impression tray, or you can just retrofit your own. It's not difficult. Um, I like to use a heavy and a light body impression, kind of like uh, your conventional crown and bridge impressions. Um, then for these open impression trays, once the impression material is loaded in there and it sets up, then we just unscrew these. Some of them you can unscrew with your finger like these have little, uh, little grippy on there. Otherwise, you might need a screw. Um, once you get the impression out of the patient's mouth, which can be an adventure sometimes, especially if you've got disparate angulation on your implants, so be careful. And one other thing to consider, especially for those of you that are looking to do, do all on four and full arch restorations, is when you're doing this step, you're going to need multi-unit, uh, the angled abutments, uh, which allow for greater angulation. They kind of correct some of the implant angulation. So there's, there's more pieces that you'll have to know. Once you get the impression, you want to inspect it. Inspect those impressions. Make sure they're what you expect them to be. Um, and make sure that all the relevant data is there uh, and that you can see uh, all the parts and pieces that you need to see. Otherwise, you're gonna end up 
either going all the way through all the processes of try-ins and stuff and get to the point where it doesn't fit, you get to do it again. But make sure you, you have an eye for a perfect impression. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about closed tray impressions. This is what most of us do and will do, are the closed tray impressions. Um, same process, we wanna verify that they're seated uh, and they will only seat when they're the right size. Uh, impression of heavy in a wash, um, verify and inspect that you got it right. And as my father would say, he spent a couple of years in England, he would say, Bob's your uncle. I still have no idea what that means. If anybody knows, please let me know. Um, so here's a, a, an idea of a good impression. Now these two implants that were here, these are impression coping impressions, um, were actually the same size, but the impression copings were different widths. So it's Nobel Active regular platform. You can see from the yellow that this is a regular platform, no, Nobel Active. Um, but the impression copings were different sizes. This is what we sent to the lab for this case. Um, and actually, I sent this to my lab because the patient didn't have time to wait. So we made those in, in the office. All right, what does the lab need when we're sending these cases out? Well, they obviously need the arch we're going to re be restoring with an appropriate restoration or appropriate impression, like you can see here. They need the opposing arch. They need a good bite impression. Um, they'll need the shade of the tooth you want. Uh, and which shade guide you use, you'll want to communicate that. Um, a lot of assistants just put Vita Shade A2, which Vita is the shade guide, but if you just put A2, who knows? You know, is it the Vita Shade Guide? Is it the Emacs Shade Guide? Is it, you know, there's a bunch of different shade guides. So make sure you communicate really clearly. Give the lab all the information you need. And you can have these phone calls in advance. You know, call the lab and say, hey, I only use this shade guide, or what shade guide would you recommend? And oftentimes they'll actually give you one because it means they'll have to redo crowns less. Um, if you want characterization, especially on anterior teeth, draw it out. You know, draw the tooth out on a piece of paper and highlight, I want this shade here and this shade here and put some nuance here. Send them a high resolution photo of the patient's adjacent teeth so they can match it. And I know there are a lot of labs that will do on-site shade matching. They may not be doing it right now in COVID-19, but there are a lot of labs that will do some shade matching. And then make sure you send the appropriate prescription form and maintain those records. Okay, we talked about closed tray and open tray or open tray and closed tray impressions. Let's talk a little bit about the digital uh, impression process, which is what I use almost exclusively. Um, it's basically the same process, except instead of placing a healing about or a, an impression coping, we're going to place a scanning coping. You can see here this is a Serona tie base, titanium base. This is the tie base itself. And these are implant platform specific, not just implant specific, but implant platform specific with a stainless steel screw. And this is a scan cap. And this is unique to this particular system. So again, we have to make sure that it's seated with a good x-ray and then scan everything. Um, and then in this case, generally, I'll have the patient leave or wait for a couple hours um, and before we put the uh, crown in when we're making them in office. Uh, and so I want to replace the healing abutment so the tissue doesn't collapse uh, while we're putting that crown on. Okay. I'm gonna do a little shout out here to Digital Dentistry with CEREC. Every single one of these cases that you see here were done in one appointment with CEREC technology uh, in the office. Some of these are pretty life-changing smile makeovers uh, for some of these patients, especially on the lower right. Um, so if you haven't invest investigated, if you haven't evaluated some of your options with regard to digital dentistry, um, now would be a good time. There are a lot of great options out there. I know CEREC has been out there forever um, and I've been using it since 2006. Um, I, I'd highly recommend it, but there are other options too. Okay, so this is a little bit of a scan video. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead a little bit to the last part. You can see we're placing the healing abutment or the scanning abutment with the scan cap. And this requires a very specific orientation because it has to be oriented to line up with a groove, otherwise, how will the system know where the uh, indexing is on the implant? And once we've got that in place, then uh, the scanning happens. This uh, image, this video seemed to come across a little bit better. Uh, and that's a CEREC Omnicam. Uh, this video was taken in 2000, 2014, so it was a few years ago. Yeah, the scanning just takes a few minutes. And once it's scanned, um, 
we'll take that piece off, put back on the healing abutment. I'm going to kind of slide through here. Um, and then there's the design process, which I'll highlight just a little bit. This is obviously not the same case. Um, this is an older version of the CEREC software. It takes a little bit of training and learning and experience, but it allows us basically complete control of the design process to do our um, implant restorations or bridges or crowns or veneers or inlays or onlays. Move along here, I know we're running short on time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the types of restoration um, that we have. We've talked about the impression processes, we've talked a little bit about the three types of impressions, the, the open tray, the closed tray, and the digital impression. So let's talk about the types of restoration. So we've moved past the second, assisting and understanding the options available when restoring single tooth dental implants. That's for us. The first one is for our patients. Second is for us. Now the third one is to walk through some of those processes. So we basically have two types of implant restorations and we're talking about single tooth implant restorations. We're not gonna dig into the multi-implant restorations right now. There's cement retained, which you see on the left and screw retained, which you see on the right. Now, most of these restorations have some cement in them. Like you can see, this is lithium disilicate and this is a titanium and they're cemented together, but they are delivered to the mouth in one piece. So we call that screw retained. Um, this piece on the other hand, here's the custom hybrid abutment with the titanium piece and the lithium disilicate and the crown itself is cemented after the fact. So that's why we call it a cemented um, restoration. For those of you that may not know, probably all of you already know that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cement retained and some of the benefits there. There's no need and there's no access hole. You know, if we're doing a screw retain, the whole thing screws into the mouth. We have to patch that afterwards. Um, so that's, that's the plus. However, conventional cementing um, carries a marginally higher risk for some peri-implantitis because sometimes the cement that's around the margin of your crown will get down below and possibly contribute to some inflammation around that interface. So where possible, I'd suggest we look at, excuse me, screw retained implant restorations. Um, and Nobel has this really interesting angled screw that you can use. The screw can be, you know, the driver can be at like a 15 or 20 degree angle different from the screw. It's very interesting. But this is a cement retained. Okay, so a couple of images of cement retained. Um, this is a great case, of course, not in a patient, just not a type of that. Uh, some natural variation in tooth anatomy and morph morphology. Uh, you can see the titanium base again, you know, and, and we can certainly get pure titanium abutments um, or you can get a separate zirconia or you can get a gold, you can get a cast. There are all sorts of options, but generally what most implant uh, restorations, the abutment is, is manufactured using a titanium interface to the implant with some sort of a prosthetic or some sort of a ceramic attached to the titanium. That reduces the risk of having that screw that's holding all the force potentially causing a fracture of the ceramic because the screw is anchored in the metal. Um, I've had some fracture, some of the all zirconia abutments fracture. Okay, let's dig into the next one, screw retain. So most of my posterior crowns, uh, single tooth implant restorations are screw retained because it allows for perfect marginal cleanup because we attach that or the lab attaches it and I can completely control this margin by polishing and cleaning it before it goes in the patient's mouth then all I have to do is adjust the tissue pressure. There's no cement. There's a less of a risk of cement necrosis. They're easier to retrieve because you don't have to drill through anything but your own composite and they have better retention because they're screwed in, not cemented in. All right, here's a couple of images of screw retained. And again, generally speaking, and this may not hold true for everything, but generally speaking, anterior teeth oftentimes are cement retained with, with regard to implant restoration. Posterior teeth, are oftentimes screw retained um, just because it's, it, it's a little bit easier to facilitate those posterior because of the angulation of the implant. All right, how are we doing? Everybody still with me? Anybody asleep yet? It's not that you'd be able to answer, right? Okay, so delivery process, let's walk through this a little bit. So first step, of course, now we've got the clearance from the oral surgeon or the periodontist or from ourselves. After the torque test, to go ahead and deliver the crown um, or to restore it. So we took our impression, um, we sent all the stuff off to the lab that we have, uh, and now we've got a 
crown back, whether we made it or whether the lab made it. There's several steps we want to make sure that we're going through to protect the long-term outcome. So take off that healing abutment if it's still there. Um, sometimes I get patients that will call freaking out, my implant fell out, oh my gosh. And then I ask them, well, how big is the piece that fell out? Oh, it's about, you know, two millimeters. I'm like, yeah, that's probably not the implant. Um, so make sure you torque those down, finger pressure tight enough they don't fall out. But remove that healing abutment. We're going to try on the abutment and or the restoration, depending on what you have. Um, verify the tooth position and tissue pressure, uh, and the adjacent teeth pressure, I guess I should say. Um, if you put too much pressure on the gingiva, you will cause problems from pressure necrosis. And you don't want to screw that crown in so tight that you can't floss, because that creates another problem. Um, so verify that you have the correct angulation, slide that crown down and get good pressure. Um, adjust it so that it seats, verify that it's seated with an x-ray and just tighten it to finger pressure. Um, and then torque it to specification. For me, Nobel, um, I use Nobel primarily and Restore primarily Nobel. Um, and they're 35 Newton centimeters except for the 3.0 implants, which are 25. Um, don't go past that number. I've had to retrieve a couple of my own broken abutment screws and that is not pleasant. Um, so be cautious, make sure you know exactly how much torque you should put on that screw and that your torque wrench is going the right direction. Um, double check it, implant or uh, yeah, abutment screws are difficult to, to retrieve. Um, okay, protect the abutment screw. I would always recommend you protect the abutment screw with Teflon. Um, you can also use PVS, something that does not biodegrade. Don't put cotton in there. Uh, cotton will tend to turn your composite black and brown and gross and leak and smell. So use something like Teflon. You know, I usually use about two inches of Teflon tape, which I'll spin into a little snake and then pack it down in there really tight. Um, and like you can see here, this is Teflon tape that's in here. Um, I think this was before we sealed that up. I'm gonna check out the cantilever on that sucker. That one's leaning over quite a bit. All right, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about um, cement retain. Uh, Oftentimes when we're doing cement retained restorations, we have to make a decision about what type of cement to use. When I was in dental school, when I came out in 2006, Dr. Woolsey always recommended that we used a temporary crown cement for our implant crowns. And the rationale for that was you have such an incredibly tight interface that there's gonna be no movement whatsoever with a temporary cement so it'll retain just fine. Um, I have had crowns come out uh, that were cemented with temporary cement, so I'll move to a permanent cement. Usually I just loot them. I don't bond them. I just loot these uh, cement retained crowns in place unless I have a very short abutment and then I'll actually bond it. But looting seems to work just fine in most cases. Um, make sure we're managing the occlusion. Um, the general rule of thumb, unless you have multiple implants connected to each other, the implant occlusal table should be narrower and bear less pressure in maximum intercuspation than a natural tooth would. Um, they're not, implants generally are not geared to take the lateral force of lateral and protrusive and re retrusive movements, so we have to manage that. The only contact should be an MIP, and there should be no other interferences. You want to manage that. So after the crown is delivered, you always want to have the patient back in a couple of weeks to ensure that the implant uh, occlusion is still appropriate, there wasn't any shifting, the tissue response is good. If we need to retrieve the crown and let things rest or heal, we can always do it at that point. But always make sure that you're, you're taking things in the best interest of the patient. So we've talked about, I think everything that I had planned to talk about. Let's see, did we nail them all down? We talked about methods and processes to diagnose and educate patients on the single tooth dental implant therapy. Uh, understanding the options available in restoring single tooth implants and workflows for successful single tooth dental implant restorations. I think we got it. So that's it. Um, what you're looking at now is just kind of a, a collage of a whole bunch of different uh, cases. Um, the, the several that you see here on the left, this is the largest CERT case I did in one day. It was 24 crowns. We did it in about six hours, start to finish from prep to deliver the final restoration. So again, another plug for, for Sarek. But thanks for spending the time, um, the at last hour with me. What questions do you have? Hey, Dr. King. So we do have a few questions here in the chat box. Um, the first one is, do you use provisionals for some soft tissue contouring? Absolutely, that's a really good question. Uh, the, sh the short answer is yes. 
Um, I also find uh, oftentimes I will just contour the tissue where I want it and then put a permanent restoration in place um, rather than uh, using a provisional. But it, that works oftentimes. Um, you know, I know one of my, one of my uh, compatriots, one of my colleagues uh, does that with almost every case, so contour the tissue. I've found personally that I don't necessarily do that with every case. Um, I'll oftentimes actually surgically contour the tissue. So, what else? Great. So the next one is, uh, can you discuss who does the lab work in your office? The lab work. So if we're talking about uh, the lab work for the implant restorations, um, I have a couple of assistants that I am comfortable handing all of that off to. Um, some of them I'm not comfortable handing them off to. Uh, usually what I like to do is, is I will have, um, I'll, I'll do all the design process on the CEREC. I've been doing it for so long, I can do it so quickly that I'll do all the design process, digital design stuff. Now, if it's pouring up models, if it's getting lab scripts going out, then um, I will delegate that to the assistants. But all the complex design stuff, I do all that. Um, the attachment of the implant restorations uh, to the tie bases, I, like I said, I have a couple of dental assistants that I really trust to do that. So, how do you order your scan body from the company or lab? Uh, scan, you can order them from both. Um, you'll probably get a better deal if you order it directly from the company. The labs oftentimes want to mark things up. Um, and sometimes we ran into this once some of the, some of the labs will actually use a knockoff version, um, which could potentially lead to issues with warranties. Um, but yeah, usually we order them directly from, I think we, I, we use the dent supply scan bodies. There are some other um, well-known brand names out there that I haven't used that are excellent, um, but we order ours directly from the suppliers, not from the lab. But the labs oftentimes will have whatever scanning pieces you need because they'll carry the, like that ELOS kit that I showed you. Um, they will carry some of those kits um, and they'll give it to you or sell it to you, assuming you're willing to send cases their way. Right, and I believe this next question is referring to uh, Sarek. Did you need a lot of training after school to get used to it? Uh, yes. So I had a weekend course uh, after dental school. You know, I, I bought my first, I, I bought two training units. So essentially I got half price. Um, so I got two units for the price of one. Uh, I had two offices at the time. Uh, and I spent a weekend, you know, it was like the Thursday, Friday, Saturday or something, um, doing nothing but CEREC. And then at that time, you could actually download a version of the software on a laptop. So I remember early out, out of dental school, you know, new practices growing. I'm sitting in bed, new software, you know, laptop there, working on designing, trying to figure wow. things out while we had the TV on. So there was a lot more than just those, those three, uh, three days. I didn't really feel comfortable using it. And, and to some, uh, you know, I still run across times where it's, it's a challenge to get certain cases to the point where I feel really comfortable. You know, that last case, the big case, the 24 unit case, um, that was, that required a lot of planning and pre-planning and thinking and timing. And, you know, we had two CEREC machines, two milling units in the office going at the same time. And I had two CEREC units side by side doing the design work. Um, otherwise it would never have worked. It would have been 13 or 14 hours long. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question again, uh, a three day class and then a whole lot of on the job training. But for those of you who are interested in getting into CEREC or one of the other digital design stuff, I'd say make it easier on yourself. Don't try to design the restorations in front of your patient. Um, and maybe for the first handful or dozen or 50 or 100 or whatever you're comfortable with, do it the old fashioned way. Take a pre-impression, you know, for a temporary, scan like you would be designing it in office, then have the assistant manufacture a temporary, then take your lunch break or time after work to design that crown away from the stress of the dental, the dental office. Um, I think you'll find doing it that way is a lot more comfortable than just sitting there in front of a patient saying, oops, I don't know how to do this. Let me get my phone and search through sericdoctors.com. You know, spend some time doing your research, but make it easy on, your, on yourself. Great, thank you. And yeah. Dr. Clifford, if you're still on this call, you feel free to unmute yourself and expand on this, but um, they asked, how often does the screw get loose? Uh, so I had a follow-up question, uh, if you yeah. don't mind. Uh, so can we like start the practicing for CEREC now? Are there any courses to help us students? Uh, you bet. You know, there are all sorts of online uh, courses available. Um, you know, CEREC is one. Um, cdocs.com, I think they abbreviated it. 
Um, if you go to YouTube, there are a lot of us that have a lot of videos, basic and more complicated videos on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel with a hundred and some odd videos. Most of them are CEREC related. Um, but yeah, you can certainly start uh, if you, you know, make some connections with, you know, a Patterson sales rep. Um, I'm sure they would be more than willing to let you sit down in their, you know, in their branch location and uh, spend some time actually playing with one of the CEREX. Of course, beyond that, if you have a, a dentist friend or, or a, you know, family member, I'm sure they'd be willing to let you use that machine if you have one. Um, and to answer the screw loosening question, um, I have had one tie base crown that I know of loosen on me. Um, and that was because it, it's, a, it's a really challenging case. Uh, it's a gentleman who the implant has, it's the third time the implant's been replaced by the oral surgeon. And only about the, the lowest, the apical one third of the implant actually has bone attached to it now. Um, it has not moved. That bone is rock solid now. He's not losing that implant. But I think what's happening is there's a little bit of flex on the top of the implant, and so it's slowly allowing that implant screw to loosen. So I've, I've tightened this screw down a couple of times. Um, I replaced the screw once, and it's a Nobel Active regular platform, uh, narrow platform, I'm sorry, and it's a, it's a first molar. So it's got a whole lot of potential excursive and lateral and medial and all those other intrusive cursive things. Um, problems going on. So the last thing we did, he was in the office about a month ago, maybe it was two months before COVID. We just leveled the occlusion on that tooth. So there, there's literally no, nothing but a, an MIP contact, nothing else, and we'll see what happens. But with other implants, I think I've, I've retrieved a couple of broken screws. One or two of those might have been my own. Um, you don't see the screws loosening very often. If, you know, if the interface is clean, if you torque it to spec, you don't see that very often. So, but I have seen it a few times. Thank you, that answers my question. Yeah. All right, so the next one you kind of hit on already. So what would be some good continuing education courses to get trained further in placement of implants? Ooh, placement of implants. Well, you know, hands-on uh, education is always gonna be the best. When I went through my, uh, you know, training with Dr. John Julian, um, it was, I wanna say it was a three-day course. I think it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And all day Thursday and all day Friday, we were in an office. This was in Kansas City. Um, and the office uh, had donated its time probably in return for uh, the training course from Dr. Julian. And he had set up a, a whole bunch of patients. So he did like two hours of lecture, then he, we did like two or three hours of implant placement. And so we, it was a group of like 10 or 12 of us, we all got to look right over his shoulder and he had a cameraman with a, you know, a, a zoom lens and the big screen. And so we could watch everything. And it was amazing to me you know, because there's this mystique around dental implants, at least for me as a dental student, as a young dentist. It was interesting to watch him kind of peel that, you know, outer layer of the mystique off of dental implant placement. It's like, oh, yeah, I can place a post in a tooth. I can place an implant. You just got to watch out for the nerve and perforating buccalingual. Um, but as far as, you know, CE and continuing education training, um, you know, Dr. Garg with implant seminars, there, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them out there now. Um, you can do tons and tons of online learning, um, but what you'll want to try to do is get into a, a hands-on course. And those get kind of pricey, um, but if you vet the course, if you look at the reviews, it'll be well worth the time and the investment. Right. Uh, how have you managed complications such as peri-implantitis, pressure necrosis, and dehiscence? So generally, peri-implantitis and dehiscence, I'll send to my periodontist. Um, and you know you can you can kind of see these coming. Um, the nice thing about it is my periodontist, his implants, I have almost never had any issues like that. Um, the pressure necrosis problem. Usually, what we'll do is we'll do a couple of things, and sometimes I've, I've called him up and he's you know kind of walk me through what you do and and undo the implant, take your high speed and a and a fine diamond burr and contour the gums until you can place the implant down there with no blanching of the tissue, um, advise the patient, et cetera, et cetera, and post up and follow up. Um, dehiscence and stuff, you know, if there's a full-on dehiscence, um, generally that'll involve a debriding of the implant surface, which means a full thickness flap elevated, removal of the bone, making sure that there's no infection there, um, and then placement of a bone graft in the appropriate preparation stages, and oftentimes a tented titanium membrane. So that stuff I'll, I'll leave to the specialist to do. Um, in some cases, if there's a significant dehiscence, in some cases, then they're better off replacing the implant. Um, after taking the tooth out. 
Um, but yeah, those usually, not to, not to cop out of the question, but those usually are, I send straight to my, to my specialist, the oral surgeon or the periodontist. Okay, next one up is before buying your implant system, do you consult with your oral surgeon to match them or what do you use to make this decision? So um, as far as implant system is concerned, uh, if we're talking about the, like the scanning side of things, my understanding is that every reputable manufacturer that's out there um, will have some sort of a scanning system, you know, parts and pieces that you can get that will go along with um, whatever scanning system you have, um, whether it's the CEREC or whether it's the Shine version or whether it's, you know, they'll, they'll have some kit that you can get. Um, it's, it's a good idea to consult with whatever surgeon, whether it's a periodontist or oral surgeon you're going to be working with, um, to find out what system they're using, you know, what implant system they're using to make sure that you're comfortable restoring that. Um, but most surgeons are, are comfortable and have placed more than just one system. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can definitely communicate with them. Uh, if it, you know, and specifically if you're talking about the, the surgical placement kit, um, again, same, same question. I would go ahead and just have a consultation, you know, go out to lunch with your oral surgeon or your periodontist and talk with them about what they'd suggest, what they recommend and how it's worked for them and, and go in that direction. All right. Last one for you. So you're getting a lot of thank yous, Dr. King. Um, oh. How often do you use custom abutments versus stock abutments? And do you design and mill your own abutments with CEREC? So um, the custom abutment, stock abutment question, um, you know, I think that's mostly for me, it's a coding question. Uh, anterior wise, if for instance, I was gonna be sending a lab case to the lab, an implant case to the lab, um, on an anterior tooth, I would almost always have them make a custom abutment. Um, and then a separate crown over the top of it. Um, because I like to have that custom abutment mimic basically a tooth preparation um, that generally will yield the best outcome. Um, stock abutments usually posterior wise, uh, posterior teeth, I'll, I'll use the stock abutments. Um, that's again, if we're sending it to the lab, uh, but in about 99% of the time, I'm gonna be making my own uh, implant crowns uh, using CEREC. Uh, so the titanium base, it depends, sorry to bump the screen there. The titanium base, um, you can coat it in one of two ways. If you manufacture an abutment, you can coat it as, you know, for billing purposes, as a custom hybrid abutment. Um, but if you're using a screw retained restoration, you need to coat it as a screw or a stock abutment um, so that there's no confusion there. Um, so to answer your question, I guess I use both. Uh, but usually anterior, if it's going to the lab, we'll do a custom abutment. And then posterior, we'll use the stock abutment. Okay, so we had a few more pop up here. Um, sure. Do you suggest to use hostile, and I might be pronouncing that okay. wrong, a hostile unit for measuring torque? You know, I, I, uh, I've heard some about it. Uh, honestly, I don't really know much about it, to be honest. I've, I've kind of got stuck in my, my ways as an old dentist, I guess. I just do it the old fashioned way. Um, but I have heard very positive reviews about that, that unit. Um, I don't think my surgeon or periodontist use it. Um, but, you know, it, it's, if there's, there's good science to back it up, it's definitely worth, worth using if it's not too pricey. And I don't know much about the cost. All right. And the next one is, do you use surgical guides? Um, so early on, I used a lot of surgical guides. Um, I would usually make them myself. Um, old school, you know, impression and then do a suck down and kind of gauge where I wanted the implants. Um, you know, I haven't placed my own implants to any great degree for at least five years. Um, but up until that point, I really wasn't using any surgical guides um, with the exception of the one case that I showed you that we did uh, digitally and had them print the guide or mill the guide. Um, I, you know, having done it enough, I was really comfortable with the placement that I felt like I could, I could place them without a guide. And to be honest, the time and the expense can become really, I don't know, it's really difficult to work with oftentimes when you have to take an impression and then you have to send it off to the lab or you spend the time milling it with your milling machine um, and then fabricate the guide and put the sleeve in and get the keyway and all this stuff. It can become really cumbersome to do it that way. You know, I, my main motto is trying to serve as many patients as I can in an efficient way. And if we have to take 
you know, 18 steps to get to an implant, that's, that can be, it can be a challenge. So generally I'm not using a guide. Um, when I was placing my implants, if I had a patient come in that needed a tooth out or needed an implant, we'd put it in. Like I remember this is in Albuquerque. Um, I had a gentleman come in and uh, he had five teeth missing and he had one toothache. And so, you know, the conversation went something like this. Hey, it looks like, it looks like you need a root canal in the crown and five implants. What do you think? And so we, we did that. <laughs> of course, he was financially, he was in a good place. Um, but yeah, I, I don't use a guide much. Um, there is value. There's definitely value. Um, but I don't use guides much. Great. Thank you. Well, I think yeah. that was our last question. And again, Dr. Kinger, you're getting a bunch of thank yous um, in the chat box. So I'll go ahead and close this out here. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. And uh, for any of uh, you out there who may have joined a little late, uh, I just want to repeat and say that we ask that you please change your name on your personal video screen to your first and last name in order to provide you CE credit for attending. Um, our next webinar will take place next Tuesday, and this will be a dentist and hygienist collaboration with the topic being increased productivity and profitability. And again, CE will be provided for attending that webinar. Um, again, thank you, Dr. King. This was a great lecture. And again, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat box. We appreciate your time. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for spending the time. And thanks for having me.